cross of Jesus, I find a place to stand and wonder such mercy that calls me as I am. For hands I should discard me Of Jesus, my unworthy soul is one. Beneath the cross of Jesus. Jesus, the path before the crown, we follow in his footsteps where promised hope is found. How great the joy! Jesus, we will gladly live This is Holy Tuesday, the last week of Jesus' life on earth, the culmination of the earthly ministry of the Son of God the Word made flesh who lived among us. After three years of teaching people, of healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, making the lame to walk, raising people from the dead, and showing the love and mercy of God to people who so desperately needed it, he was down to his last week. For his entire ministry, Jesus had not only been teaching people, but he had also trained 12 disciples, 11 of whom would be the leaders who would assume the responsibility of spreading the gospel after he left them. His teaching reached a crescendo in this week with his predictions of the future, including his own death and resurrection, the demise of the temple in Jerusalem, and his coming again at the end of the age. His popularity had exploded, and so had the hatred and resentment of the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of his people. On this Holy Tuesday, Jesus was back in the temple teaching, as was his custom, after having cleansed the temple the day before. The religious leaders, always looking for a way to trip him up, questioned his authority to do the things he was doing. However, as usual, Jesus outsmarted them with his response and frustrated them. And then he said, listen to this parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them in the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come on, let's kill him and take his inheritance. 
So they took him and threw him outside the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Now at this point, the religious leaders do not yet realize that Jesus is speaking about them. They don't realize that they are prophetically speaking of their own demise when they respond to them. Listen to their indignant response. Well, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. So here, Jesus tells them directly the meaning of the parable, and then they got it, and they were infuriated. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, They knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people thought he was a prophet. Now the vineyard in this parable represents the nation of Israel. God was the owner who lovingly planted the vineyard and provided everything necessary for its care. The tenant farmers represented the chief priests scribes and Pharisees and elders, the leaders that God had set in place over the nation to lead and shepherd his people, to tend and nurture this this vineyard so that it would produce the fruit of righteousness. You know, God desired the same thing for his people then that he does of us now, to love him with all our heart and mind and soul and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. The actions of the owner in the parable demonstrate the love and patience of God who sent prophet after prophet to Israel's leaders, messengers who made God's expectations crystal clear. They extolled the blessings for obedience, the love and mercy and forgiveness of God for those who would repent and also prophetically warning of the results of continued disobedience. But Israel's overseers, like the tenant farmers, continued in their rebellion and treated God's messengers with nothing but contempt and treachery. Finally, the owner sent his very own son, and they threw him outside the vineyard and killed him. They wanted the vineyard for themselves. They wanted to be in the place of God. Not only did the scribes and Pharisees realize Jesus was talking about them, but they also realized that he was claiming to be the son of God. Disastrously for them, they were blind to the message. They were blind to the fact that they were meant to show the rest of the world the love and justice of God by loving justice, doing kindness, and walking humbly with their God. Instead, they were proud and arrogant. Though Israel was under the power of the Roman government, these religious leaders had a high standing in their society and a degree of power over the people, which they did not want to lose. Jesus did not fit the image of the Messiah they expected based on their interpretation of the Old Testament prophecies, and they didn't want him rocking their boat. For them, this was the last straw. And Jesus knew it. Still, Matthew tells us that Jesus went on and continued with several more parables that were veiled denunciations of them. And then he really let them have it with a whole string of woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. They had not honored God through love and the love and obedience that he had required. But they put themselves in the place of God, deciding what was right and what was wrong to suit their own purposes. Finally, they rejected God's Messiah, 
and that was the last straw for God. He finally rejected them as leaders and shepherds of his kingdom and of his people. That was the warning in the message of the parable. They got that the parable was a criticism of them, and it made them angry. But they didn't get the point of it. You know, it's really easy from our vantage point to criticize the scribes and the Pharisees. On nearly every occasion that they're mentioned in the New Testament, they're harsh, hard-hearted, and cruel. They were more concerned with self-righteously keeping the letter of the law than they were with the needs of the human beings the law was made to protect. As we read what they say and do, it's difficult to understand how they could be so heartless. But wait, let's reflect for a moment. We have the advantage of them over them of hindsight, and hindsight's always 2020. Let's think about ourselves for a moment. Maybe take the board out of our own eye so we can see clearly. Do we ever do these same kinds of things? Do we ever decide which scriptures to accept or reject based on what we want to believe, what's convenient for us, rather than accepting the whole truth of God? Do we ever act in self-righteous ways and look down on people that are not like us? As disciples of Jesus, our goal is to conform our lives day by day to his teachings and make ourselves available to God's transforming work in our hearts and souls. We have inherited the privilege and responsibility of being witnesses for Jesus and of demonstrating to the world the love and justice of God. It's our turn now. As we journey together through this Holy Week toward Easter Sunday, let us reflect on this question. How are we doing with that? Mm -hmm.